In this section, we'll talk about the carrier and pilot allocation in 802.11a. Here we show the allocation of uh, carriers that carry data and pilots in 802.11a. There are 48 carriers that have data coded bits, and there are four pilots in 802.11a. The pilots are in fixed locations. The pilots are used to track changes after initial acquisition, including uh, initial equalization. For example, pilots are used to track the residual carrier offset error, which, when you have noise, causes the rotation of the constellation, and also pilots are used to track timing drift. Of importance is that when the station is moving or in mobile situations, you have changes due to Doppler shift and fading due to Doppler and the pilots are used to track and correct for those changes also. As you can see from this diagram you have 26 carriers to the right and 26 carriers to the left including the data and pilots. The total bandwidth is around 16.6 .6 megahertz. You have a null at DC. You also have null carriers to the right and null carriers to the left. There are six null carriers to the left, and there are five null carriers to the right. Our guard intervals in the frequency domain, they are used to protect agents and channels against leakage, and also they allow guard interval for filtering, and also to meet the spectral mask requirements. The spacing between carriers is 312.5 kilohertz, and as we indicated, the total bandwidth is around 16.6 .6 megahertz. The bandwidth from here on the left to the right, including the guard bands, the guard intervals, is 20 megahertz. Here we show the transmit spectral mask, shown in the bold line here. The actual spectrum of the modulated OFDM signal in 802.11 is a typical example is shown over here, where the bandwidth is 16.6 .6 megahertz. You have about 8.3 megahertz of information here, and then you have the guard interval, the zero or null carriers at the guard, in, guard intervals, and you have to filter the modulated OFDM signal in such a way so that you meet the requirements of the transmit spectral mask. Going back to the pilots, if we set pilot tones at these fixed locations and do not change them over the length of the packet, then you will have spectral lines in the spectrum and of course this will violate the regulatory requirements. One way to approach this is to take the pilots and multiply them on a symbol per symbol basis with a pseudo random sequence of plus one and minus one and this way modulate them, modulating them so that they are spread out and you don't have spectral lines. At the receiver the pilots are multiplied by the same sequence and it is as if you had the pilots with a fixed amplitude. As we observe the spectrum with the guard intervals and the nulls at DC and the allocation of the data carriers and the pilots, let's take a look at how the carriers are actually input to the inverse FFT. The inverse FFT computes the inverse uh, FFT of the 64 carriers, numbered 0 through 63, for a 64-point inverse FFT. And this diagram shows how they are allocated. So the Positive 26 carriers are allocated to the top. DC is allocated to zero. From number 27 through 37, the nulls are allocated, and of course, the negative frequency components. And this is how it has to be set up for the inverse FFT to produce the correct OFDM symbol in the time domain. Here we discuss the pseudo-random sequence used to multiply the pilots on a symbol per symbol basis in order to avoid having line spectra. Essentially we have a 127 length sequence, ones and minus ones, and the way this works is at the transmitter for every OFDM symbol we multiply the pilots in that OFDM symbol by either a one or a minus one. Starting from the first symbol that is transmitted after the preamble, which is the signal field. The signal field encodes the length and rate of the packet using BPSK. The pilots with a single field are all multiplied by 1. 
the next symbol, its pilots are multiplied by 1, followed by the next symbol multiplied by 1, and 1, and so forth, until you get to the fifth symbol, in this case, where the pilots are multiplied by minus 1. Depending on the length of the packet, you would exhaust the sequence at a certain point. The pseudorandom sequence that you see here can actually be generated using the same generator used to, gener to scramble the data. So this is a diagram of the uh, generator that is used to scramble data. And the scrambler works by actually loading a seed into the, as the initial state of the scrambler. As data comes in, the sequence out of the feedback shift register is exclusive or with the data, thus scrambling the data. However, if we put an initial seed of all ones into the, uh, this structure here and feed in all zeros, then we will obtain a pseudo-random sequence. And the pseudo-random sequence that we showed for the pilots are generated from this circuit, but you allocate a zero to a one or map a zero to a one and a one to a minus one, and you will get this sequence shown over here. So this sequence is applied on a per symbol, per symbol basis to each pilot and at the receiver the pilots are multiplied by the same sequence so if you get a minus one at the transmitter you'll have a minus one at the receiver and overall you'll get a one and then you can use the pilots to track uh, changes in the channel changes due to carrier residual carrier offset drift timing drift and also doppler